When do you move in? We will move in end of October next year, 2019. Ready for Cole's 50th birthday party as well. And where are you living now? We've got a rented house. A an old converted chapel. So, so how much does it cost to build? I think it's going to cost 700 grand to build a house. Okay. That will get us to a watertight building. Well, that's just, I mean, including foundations, just over £1,000 a square metre, about 1,100 quid, which is, 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 is social housing territory. And good quality self-build, 2,500 a square metres. So I make that 1.5 million to actually deliver a good quality finished home. It would be a nightmare if it was going to that price. The bigger it gets, the more expensive it is to make. So the, yeah. you can't get over the, just the simple cost of labour and materials. That's the issue. It starts with a sunken courtyard and a lot of steelwork. 205 pieces in all that'll form a fairground ride frame, all about curves. The ground floor will be encased entirely in glazing, with more glass curves at the corners. The upper floors will then cantilever out in every direction to be clad in vertical strips of cedar. This curvy box should appear to almost hover above the glazed ground floor, defying gravity and even the rules of suburbia. Down the theatrical sloping drive that'll take you under the cantilever, you'll find a covered entrance leading to a generous kitchen. Tucked away on the west side of the building will be an office, a plant room and a bathroom. To the north, a set-piece spiral staircase will connect you to the first floor, where, unconventionally, the bedrooms, there are four here, are connected to a set of living spaces, with ample room to entertain in a double-height games area, complete with bar. The plan was Colin would finish the house and have his 50th birthday party in his new home. Great idea. Not really sure that reality has measured up to that, given that it was his birthday last week. Oh, nearly forgot the birthday cake. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. I brought you a cake. Oh. Oh. I haven't lit the very candle. Good. I haven't lit the candle, because I didn't know how well premature that might be. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? Nothing. Drowned our sorrows. Uh, there's not a lot happening here. Yeah. Lost our builders. Well, they disappeared two weeks ago. So let's just get this straight. And then we're going to do the entire job for a fixed sum. Yep, yep, yep. yep. This is a month's work. Yeah. Yep. And do you think you're coming back? Clearly, they've been paid up front. We've come a cropper, really, I think. You know, we've got follow-on trades. We've got rent we're having to pay while nothing is happening. We've got project managers, other people that are just kind of twiddling the thumbs, all waiting for this Latvian firm to actually just communicate and give us some information. I'm really sorry, because this is an awful situation. I thought that I thought it would... I thought, if anything, it would pick up. We are in a position where we're not going to have the money to complete. Where does that money come from? Mortgage? Mortgage. You can't get that until the place is watertight. Yes. A couple hundred grand to go to a watertight. So we're going to be scrabbling around for that. Do you have that as cash? No. Or... No. So are we saying that the money that the Latvians have got has sort of cleaned you out of your cash? Yeah. 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 So to be clear, this is a complete bottleneck. I mean, a bottleneck in terms of finance. Yeah. Nothing moves forward from here until you've sorted this constrictor out. Yeah. Bottleneck, that's, a, that's exactly what it is. It is really, really hard and you go, but you have to, do, you have to find a way, whatever, and um, you can't stop. The buildings as they get built, they're, they're like organisms, they, they grow, they flourish sometimes, and other times they, they sicken and wither, which is sort of what's happening to this project. <laughs> Giving a vast quantity of money to a foreign contractor and seeing little for it, that in my mind is, is so major. It's the equivalent of, of major organ failure. I think, this, I think this project is doomed. I don't think it can survive that kind of major trauma. My word, oh, look, the gates open automatically. There is no mud. Oh, this is, oh gosh. I mean, gosh, it oh, looks like a timber Scandinavian spaceship has landed and I am docking with it. Wow. Colin and Adele's home is finished and perfectly adorned, cloaked in the swooshing curves of western red cedar cladding, already fading to a shimmering grey. Windows mirror the trees. The balustrades and the glazed ground floor seem only half there. The wooden spaceship hovers. It's beautiful. No, not a clue 
as to the calamity of this project. I mean, it's perfect. To build this 600 odd square meter home for what, how much? 700 to 750. Okay. We added stuff that wasn't in the original brief, but I think we spent 1.7 and a bit. And the proportion of that total of 1.7 odd million, you basically paid to a Latvian company and couldn't get back. It's completely gone. No legal recourse? No, there's no recourse. Wow. Once I paid for the massive chunk of money for the windows, they knew they had me. And I knew I was done. You know, I was out in a full Nelson and there was nothing I could do and I just felt just mortified. However, you got it at a fair value, I think. 1.7 and a bit million pounds. Yeah, yeah. Which for this quality of construction is cracking good value. I'd just like to say that, first of all. <laughs> the structural frame will be locally sourced timber and infilled with straw and clay. Downstairs, family life will revolve around a rough and ready kitchen, hand built by Ed, of course. This sits next to the heart of the house, best described as a medieval hall, heated by a great stone hearth and lit by a cathedral-scale cruck-framed window that'll enjoy the vast panoramas across their Herefordshire Valley. Behind the hall will sit a snug and a small workroom for Rowena. In the centre of this arrangement, a sculpted timber staircase will lead to a first-floor gallery come landing. On one side of this, Ed will build three bedrooms for the children and a shower room. And on the other, two more bedrooms and a family bathroom. Above this handcrafted building, Ed plans a dummy thatched mansard roof. The plan was to build with as much found material as possible, economical as well as ecologically sound. By exploiting his carpentry skills, Ed knew he could save money and do most of the work himself. A noble ambition, of course, but the result was a glacially slow project. When will it be done? Oh, no time at all. Oh, no. <laughs> when? You said at the end of this summer. Oh, no. When you'll be leaving home, you'll be like, the house is finished! <laughs> Rome wasn't built in a day, and nor is anything else worth it. <laughs> but this is smaller no. than Rome, so <laughs> it should be able to be made in a day. It looked as though Ed and Rowena might never have a finished home for their family. What's finished? Yeah, there's finished and there's finished, isn't there? I mean, there's finished... No, I'm just looking for finished. So I, don't, I don't need... <laughs> no, I, I, I... Ed will have little some things, you know, some... He'll have... There always will be something. Exactly. Yeah. But this project and the ideas behind it are powerful. And I've wanted from day one to see what original delights will spring from Ed's idiosyncratic, highly creative mind. It's now almost seven years since I first met Ed and Rowena. Inside the house, Ed's divided the vast interior into recognisable rooms. And upstairs, the partition walls are plastered to make three spacious, very longed-for bedrooms for the girls. True to form, Ed can't resist spending weeks on the smallest of details. This is a stand for a basin, so the basin is upside down and I'm building the stand up the wrong way up. Uh, and the, the stand is made of loads of little bits of offcut off the floorboards. I'm building it like this, and building the little chunks, and then that'll taper up, and then I'll sand the whole thing off. Probably could have brought in some sort of base for that basin as well, but for me that would have been a bit boring. The children are now teenagers, and the family are leaving their old place and moving up the hill to the new house, and doing it their way, very, very slowly. Said I wanted a big kitchen, a larder, and a veranda. That was it. That was my requirements. And I've got my big kitchen, and I will have a larder, and I will have a veranda when that end is done. It's over ten years since I first met Ed and Rowena on their Herefordshire hillside, now marked by a very substantial house. It is 
So gratifying to see what looks like a finished house. And you know, it, it's sort of like something from a fairy tale, this building. This is Tiggy Winkle's mansion. The woodcutter's stately home. Straight off the entrance is the Great Hall. The experience of the ground floor is now a seamless juxtaposition of hall and kitchen. Oh! oh. <laughs> How extraordinary. It's glorious, Ed. The most striking thing is the Great Hall's vaulted ceiling. At six metres, a real crowning glory. Without doubt, technically accomplished and visually remarkable. And unequalled on the planet. Up here, how many have you got? One, two, three bedrooms there? Three in the bathroom. Yeah, yeah. Two that side. That's right. Five. Yeah. My question here is, you've been building for ten years, you started building when they were kids, uh, and they're now, the youngest is now 17. So, so it's not long before you find yourself with quite a lot of empty bedrooms quite a lot of the time. Has this happened too late? No. It's hard to sort of talk about that concept of, oh, well, you've built your house and they've all left yeah, emptiness. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter, does it? The experience of them growing up and it all happening around them, I think, is incredibly valuable. Can you see a time when one of them moves in here and you're, you're down Absolutely. in the... Absolutely. Mm. I mean, I, there's right, no reason why we should be hanging around in here, is there, really, if they have little families or a few of them, you know, whatever. Yeah, and I, and I think the future just sort of takes care of itself. Things that will happen and, mm. you know, it doesn't... We don't fret about that, really, do we? So, all this time, Ed has, it seems, been building an adaptable home to suit the family both now and down through the generations. That long view, the taking time to think, has defined this project. This house is more than a home. They want it to be their legacy. After years of searching, Monty found this scrap of land squeezed between two listed Georgian villas in South London. It's so tight, no one thought you could put a house on it. But with a lot of creative thinking, Monty's devised a challenging, low-cost design that fits snugly onto this awkward-shaped plot. How did you find it? Four years. Took of loads and loads of sites that I couldn't afford. Yeah. And finally, this one came through at an auction. So oh. how much did you pay for it? This is 40,000. That's very, very cheap. It sounds very cheap. It sounds cheap to me. But it took me two and a half years to get planning. So where are you at now? What's it going to be? It's going to be a mono-dimensional contemporary space of a light and airy nature. <laughs> yes, but what's it going to be? Bungalow. <laughs> <laughs> because this project's being drawn up as we go, yeah. that, that sometimes causes issues as well. That, that is hard, not having a full set of comprehensive drawings and designs, which I can literally... Monty went away for two months, I could carry on building. Whereas if Monty went away now, I could probably carry on building for a couple of weeks. To buy some time, he's forced to hire in some professionals. Of course, without drawings, explaining the design is nigh on impossible. OK, how do you want to do this, Ollie? <laughs> so Monty's design assistant steps in. This was made last Monday. It's a cereal packet. It's the back mezzanine, and it was made in order to show the um, welder where everything has to go. The, uh, the model that he fronted up, I thought it was something out of play school, and uh, I was, it was a bit of a laugh. No, I mean, that model helps us all understand it, I think. Including me, who I'm supposed to tell everyone what to do. The sliding glass roof light will be the great centrepiece of Monty's house. At least with this part of the build, Monty knows what he's doing, because he's made them before. Yes, yes, you yes. built the whole of this, this roof? Yeah. And the one you're going to build in your house, is, this, is it similar? It's... Yeah, the house ones, my ones, I mean, fractionally smaller, but otherwise the same concept, yeah. I mean, move over Thunderbird 1. Look yeah. at this. This wonderfully engineered structure weighs 600 kilos, but slides effortlessly across the roof. The piece of glass I'm lying on is six millimetres thick, but it is toughened, which means it's very, very strong. I've come back to see not only if it's complete, but also if it actually works. Well, it's grown, this building. It's rather finished, it's rather sleek for Monty. And it sits, look at that, it sits really nicely here. It's very modest. How's the place? The place is fantastic. 
Of course, the transformation from building site to home has been made even harder by the arrival of a new addition to the family. But has it been worth the effort? It's very strange living in, in terms of our own house. What, still? Own space. But you've been here so long. You still, still, you, you still sort of wake up every morning and think this is... What? But it's constantly <laughs> changing, you know, this room changes just from being uh, sort of is indoor... It, is outdoor. it still working, that? Is the, is the roof uh, still Absolutely. doing its thing? Still yeah, yeah. Oh, it's still on. working. The really weird thing is how much we use it. Do you? I, oh, well, I, 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 th I, no, well, I just thought you would, because this thing is so big, when it opens, it, uh, it changes the space from being a room into a courtyard. It does, because mm. you get all the noise and the wind just drifts yeah. in the night. If it were smaller, it would be a room with a skylight that opens, but it is yeah. so massive. <laughs> This place is so ingenious. It's like living on a boat where everything is designed to save space. Every nook and cranny is used. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's brilliant, what a solution. I tell you, this place is so well thought out. It's really compact. It's, actually, it's not so much like being on a boat. It's more like being on a space shuttle. But there has always been one idea that I've yet to be convinced about. Yeah, I see. You really use this? Yes, absolutely. You really, do you use it every day? Every day, and we don't have another bath. This is Flint's bath. Yeah, you? clearly. I said, what I rather do like is the fact that not only do you, uh, you, do you hide the bath, but you hide all the bath toys as well, which in most <laughs> bathrooms, yeah, is, with small children, so is a real away. problem. With baths under beds and sinks in drawers, there's a magical side to this home. It has a scent of humour. As Monty lights the gel fueled fire that he designed, I realise that this house does everything a normal house can do, only in a very different, exciting way. Everything in this place is bespoke, but that must have come at a cost well beyond the original £120,000 budget. We spent about £180,000, 180, 185, I think. That's pretty good. On the build, yeah. plus the 40 of the land. And did you get the mortgage in the end? Amazingly, we did. That's the really weird thing. Well, it's not weird at all, actually, because it really bugged me off, because obviously no one would give me any money originally, mm. even off the plans from an award-winning architect. Once they saw it in person, oh, wow, have loads of money. I know you've had friends lend you money. I know your mother's helped out, but your dad remortgaged his house, didn't he, to help pay for this. So have you been able to pay him back? That was what the mortgage was for. The yeah. mortgage paid yeah. him back and paid off all my friends that lent me money too. So what happens in 35, 40 years' time when Flint comes to see you and he says, Dad, could you remortgage your house to help me fund a project? What would you say? Absolutely. I have to say, you know, I mean, on the way here, I was thinking about straw, and um, it's, it's not the obvious choice for a building, is it? Particularly an urban building. So, so what, are, what are its...? Well, it isn't obvious because it hasn't really been used before as a building material very much in this country. Yeah, but... Um, Things like, it's, you know, insects and, and rat invasions and, you know, all those things that, you know, one thinks could go wrong with it. I mean, we like living with other animals. <laughs> <laughs> the new building is designed in three sections. There'll be a raised office block at one end. Sloping down from this is a living area with a great glass wall. And at the bottom end is the bedroom wing. Jeremy and Sarah plan to use unconventional materials everywhere. The walls of the bedroom wing will be made of straw bales. These will also run along the back wall of the living area up towards the office. The waterproof covering for the straw will be transparent, so you'll see the bales from the outside. My nightmare is steelwork sticking out of the ground, you know, rusting and decaying without any cladding or anything. It's just standing there as this uh, beacon of uh, failed hope uh, <laughs> for the next, you know, 20 years or something, uh, whilst I'm... we struggle, you know, to, to live in an incomplete house next door. It's classic. The uh, houses all around, dotted around England of these kind of failed dreams. And uh, to finance it, we have to sell this place so that we, equally we wouldn't have anywhere to live. So that there were, that's the kind of nightmare. Jeremy still hasn't shown the builders what they're making. Steve, have you guys seen this? Seen the model? Do you want to see it? It's quite different. You've seen it, haven't you, Steve? No, no. I see. Is that the front gate? Well, that's all gone. I thought it was the other way round. Hold on. Oh, come on. <laughs> Taking the piss. Is that what we're doing? Huh? That's what we're building now. This is a sandbag wall. Sandbags? Yeah, sandbags. 
And then this is all clad in fabric. Kind of padded fabric. Have you heard about them? No. 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 We have now. Hmm? We are really, really up against it. I mean, we're already desperately behind. We're so behind on so many items. We can't possibly make it up. A lot of the problems we're having at the moment are due to the fact that it is nothing square and you know everything's an odd dimension and curved and you know on the slope and God knows what else. Well, it's it's quite wonderful inside. Suddenly, it's a building. This, I think, is the guest bedroom, and up there is Sarah and Jeremy's bedroom. One of the things that we have been a bit concerned about is the issue of arson. Right. Um, one of the reasons being that we had an arson attack on the site and did you couldn't you? see the remains of the, um, the soot over there. which resulted what, from did it they over set, there. Did they set fire to bales or what did they There they were a few bales lying around the site at that time. Right. But the whole building's basically going to be clad in a sort of corrugated iron. It's a galvanised steel, wriggly tin, we call it. Like you might imagine a sort of um, Australian shack to look like. <laughs> yeah. 16 months ago, I left Jeremy and Sarah in the thick of their building experiment. It's now two years since they started, and the exciting news is, it's built. And it is a massive house. Parts of it are still not finished, like the library tower. But you can see every one of those individual ideas that Jeremy and Sarah have thrown into this building. It's a real architectural melting pot. It's a very difficult project. I mean, you can't kind of ring up real pages through the sandbag installers. They're just not there. You've got to work out very, very carefully before you start how you're going to do it in order to cut down the, the risk factor, which is going to cost you yes. lots of money. So how much, how much has it all cost? It's going 75. to be about half a million. So do experiments always need more money? If, if we had half as much money again, we probably could have done this building a lot quicker because we would have had the money to cushion us against the risks involved in the project, because we haven't. It, the time has been the penalty. So, Colin and Marta will have a dazzlingly complicated but elegant 335-piece steel frame, carefully designed and cross-braced to resist the fearsome wind up here. The sides and roof of the house will be super-insulated and clad in corrugated aluminium to resist corrosion. They'll also be putting in thick curtain wall glazing with a heat reflective coating. Inside, the ground floor will house a state of the art wood pellet boiler, a garage, four curved bedrooms with facilities, and a slender spiral staircase which will lead up to the first floor. Colin and Marta's elevated private apartment containing a master bedroom, a veranda, snug, and the open-plan centerpiece of their live-work home. This will be their air traffic control center for living in, a sitting room, kitchen, and balcony where they can keep track of everything going on outside. Under the large glazed roof light on the second floor will sit an office for Colin and a painting studio for Marta. Built in steel and clad in metal, this will be a domestic house built like, well, like an aircraft hangar, using commercial techniques. But it's much more complex, and it would demand every skill of a professional project manager. A couple of years ago last May, we had a fire in our neighbour's garden next door that spread through this wall. It set fire to an aircraft that was parked there. Unfortunately, because of the heat and the smoke, every aircraft that was in the hangar here, 26 aircraft, were written off as a result of the fire. We're still arguing about the insurance. Colin can't even raise a mortgage to cover the shortfall because he can't get one. His project is unusual in that it's attached to the airfield business. Without that money in place, Colin and Marta are starting a project they may not be able to finish. A project, in any case, that they're not experienced or adept enough to finish. 
This is going to be a technical piece of ambitious, expensive construction. We were told that the chap who was going to do the groundwork uh, wasn't available until August, and the steel is coming in six days' time. So Colin, who is amazing, decided to go and have a crush course on how to do the foundations. In the true pioneering spirit of aviation, Collins stepping bravely into the unknown and doing the foundations himself. Except he has no real idea what he's doing. The great thing about the internet is you can just go online 24 hours a day and you can go and get information from, like, you know, some of the biggest steel companies in the world. And uh, you can go, I can have a slightly sleepless night, but at least I <laughs> think we have a plan. I'm pretty confident these are all in the right place now. Fingers crossed we're sort of uh, on schedule. I hope so, because everything Collins learned about groundworking so far comes from a how-to internet guide. Over the next two days, they managed to get half the structure up. It's a sense of achievement, a great sense of achievement. Yeah. That makes me think that anything that happened will be able to actually uh, overcome it. Stravens on the same line of latitude as Moscow and Copenhagen. Any house built here needs to be super durable, as becomes abundantly clear in December, when Scotland is battered by the worst storms in a generation. This is the wettest I've actually ever seen it here at the airfield. In these conditions, everything takes twice as long. On the roof, they're battling the wind, trying to stop materials from blowing away. I've been on the roof for a long time, so you kind of get used to it a wee bit. Colin's men are caught in an uncomfortable catch-22. They need to complete the shell to stop the weather getting in, but they can't finish the shell because of the weather. It is not a job for the faint-hearted. <laughs> We're tough here in Scotland, you know. I'm not sure, however, whether a brave heart alone will be enough to overcome the elements and get this project back together. Magnificent. Hey. <laughs> How are you? Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Marta, how, how are you? Are you well? Yes, you're well. Good to see you both. Good to see this place looking so sharp. Indoors, it is so remarkably well finished with not a hint of condensation or rust. Pristine floors, pristine everything. Wow, I mean, it's all very, very sleek, as though it was finished last week. So, so pristine. And this is beautiful. I know, I know. Oh, it goes all the way to the top. Yeah. It's like a thermal. A discreet bathroom. With a view out over the balcony. And a snug TV room. But the heart of any home is its galley and here it's eye-poppingly bright. Oh, wow, this is, oh, goodness me, heavens. Colin and Marta's taste, their sense of fun and their love of color now spread throughout this soaring living space. This end of the building is the observation deck. Too much glass, too much greenery, too much. Too much of a good thing is wonderful. <laughs> now it's all clean and clear, it's amazing. This and you're, you're, going to you're going to inherit this? I'm going to inherit the whole farm and the whole hassle that comes with the farm. <laughs> is this it? That's it. This is magical, this place. It's beautiful. It's, it's like being in a fairy story. It's like, like it was a Victorian illustration, you know? But his home must also work for him as a farmer. To preserve and even enhance such a beautiful site, he'll have to tread lightly when cutting into the ground. Thankfully, 14 small concrete pad foundations are all that's required to support the entire weight of the structure. To further limit the damage, his home will be constructed off-site from four enormous 45-foot-long steel containers that'll be paired and knocked through to form two modules. The lower module will be sunk slightly into the hill. On the field side, it'll contain a spare room then there's a wet room and a boot room providing farmer Patrick with access to his land. Then a master bedroom with views out over the stream. The upper module will be craned into place and bolted onto the lower, forming an ambitious cantilevered cross. Inside the upper module, you'll find Patrick's architect's studio, a galley kitchen, 
stairs down and a dining area looking out to the stream, woods and mountains beyond. An adjacent lounge will terminate in another large window that leads out to a balcony. Patrick will completely disguise his containers with a perforated steel mesh above and an overcoat of rusting Core 10 steel below. And to further remove any hint of container, he's intent on adding yet more imaginative elements, daring cantilevers, a monumental chimney, terraces, and a floating staircase. If this works, it'll raise the house building bar in Northern Ireland. This sculptural building will be a game changer. How, on a scale of 10, how harebrained is the scheme? <laughs> nine out of ten. Nine, nine out of ten, ten from Anne. Oh, Jim. I go for seven, maybe. Yeah. No, I go nine as well. He's got these three D pictures, which are great. Yeah. But <laughs> what is going to be like in real life will be so different. I don't, you know, it's hard to tell. I don't like it that much. <laughs> I, should, should, I shouldn't say that, but that's just the truth of it. I personally just thought, and I looked at that. What is this going to be like? It's very easy to put a mediocre building on a really rubbish place, and it to look good. When you have a really beautiful place, mm -hmm. it demands the highest quality, doesn't it? At this moment, Paddy can only pray his measurements are correct, and his four containers drop precisely onto their concrete pad foundations. If they're even slightly out, the structure could buckle. Pull, pull, baby. I pull. Would you pull, would you? Yes. I... Good job. In just five hours, Paddy's steel sculpture has landed, and it fits together like a machine. It worked better than I thought, to be honest. Uh, I'm happy with it. Uh, I can see the finish line to an extent, even though it may seem far away, but I can see it now. I know, it's just been dumped here. So no one will have got used to the idea of the change, you know. But anybody who lives here is going to look at that and think to themselves, oh, well, look, they put the porter cabins up. When are they going to build the prison? <laughs> Tell me around your house. Nice view through the front door. Mm -hmm. You get an amazing view, don't you, out of each. Of it. My goodness me, look at that. I mean, look, so you couldn't see that. Fantastic, over the tops of the trees. We are standing in the very, very best possible place because we're not standing over there on the road looking back at it because it looks like a shit heap from over there. <laughs> this is three, this is three. Uh, three months I'll change your mind. <laughs> it's been just 10 months since farmer and architect Patrick Bradley started to build an agricultural home from shipping containers on the family farm. This is where worlds collide, where Paddy, the architect, meets Paddy the farmer and builder, where engineering and steel meet landscape, and it's beautiful. Through the front door up above, what were two giant containers is now one seamless space, with kitchen and living areas all of a piece. I like this, what a treat. Up here, there's no sense of containment, but connection through big windows to the distant landscape. This, it's all about this, uh, this view, isn't it? You know, that, that way, that way, that, that way. way. The three mountains. The three mountains. Oh, wow. I love the way that rusty orange frame just separates the, the wildflower bit from the field beyond. You know, it's just a nice little, little, uh, little architectural detail, that, that little frame. And this, this is, this is pure genius. Fake grass, wild forest. It's, and mountain beyond. I mean, that is a, that's a kind of Lord of the Rings view, right? <laughs> uh, with fake grass in it. And you think, no, 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 surely not. But actually, it sort of, a sort of... Makes it functional. And do you know what? What? I can't get it. I can't get that whiff of container. <laughs> Edward and Hazel's project felt it might run onto the rocks from the moment they knocked down their 1950s home. Strange set of emotions because it's a family home. Oh my God! 
Excavating deep into the cliffs, they were determined to build a great complex of Art Deco maritime buildings. I was wondering whether you think you could have compromised here? No compromise, no, no. Costs ran into the millions. The pressures to keep their dream alive were horrendous. All our it's money gone. is gone, all borrowed, and it's all gambled. After seven years, the building was still a gigantic steel and concrete shell. I've just got to get out of this mess, really. Can't come this far and give up. The whole project, mired in debt, had finally run aground. The end game could still be bankruptcy. And Edward and Hazel's hopes and dreams were but a wreckage. All in all, there are six bedrooms in this modernist rock star pad. The rather vast main kitchen and living space will enjoy uninterrupted views across the pool to the sea beyond and will connect via a small flight of stairs to the main tower and to the dining room, glazed with nine-foot-high windows. Above this will be a dressing room. On the third floor of the lighthouse, the master bedroom, and at the very top, a glazed observation room, Edward's storm room. A pretty jaw-dropping cantilevered access road will hang mid-air as it sweeps down from the main road. And as if there weren't drama enough, time will add its own cliffhanger, literally, as the sandstone erodes over the years, leaving the building to float above the sea. The diagnosis for the build was bleak. The main lighthouse complex was a huge concrete carcass. The much smaller eye at least gave a clue as to what might have been. Oh, well, it's like descending into a grotto. It's, it's, it's nice to have the opportunity to show you something I've finished. But the impact of this project had taken its toll on Edward and Hazel's relationship. We parted company last year. Uh, I mean, it's, I put her through a horrendous time with this, you know, knocking the family home down, not building another one, all our money into it. No one's got any idea what the outcome is. I don't think it's much worse than that for a partner. So um, that's, that's the guilt. I, I have to take it on the chin. My ambition and vanity has is, is probably collapsed the marriage. So that's that. I think that's probably the truth. With total debts amounting to nearly four million pounds, Edward was struggling to keep ownership of this project. No one would buy the eye at the premium price he needed because of the hazardous building site next door. And he would have to borrow huge amounts of money to complete the lighthouse. Well, <laughs> by Neptune, there is at least a lighthouse. Oh, my giddy aunt. The rotunda punctures the skyscape and stands so proudly on this headland as if it had always been there. That looks finished. I mean, that, that is oh, superb. And it's, it's got furniture in it. How Edward has managed to finish his Bond villain's lair is mystifying. So you are going to sell it? So the uh, investor in this, which is a property development lender. Yeah. So they have said it should be sold. Yes, yeah. it will be sold together. Um, well, the two houses yeah, they have to go together. The I and this, yeah. the debt, uh, and the servicing of that loan. There is no. If someone came along and cleared the debts buying this and didn't and said you can have that, I'm not going to say no, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, you can have a little dream, but it's unrealistic. Remarkably, Edward has managed to finance this building to completion, but he will never live in his beloved lighthouse. I'm not sure I'll ever get to see a project like this again, but on this outcrop of North Devon, no one will ever forget whose lighthouse this really is. <laughs>